given that yeah our participants I can see everyone in the box there I think we'll make a start if that's if that's all right um well um good morning everyone and and welcome to October's Future South webinar really pleased you could join us today um my name's Liz Harris I'm the environmental officer at Solent University and I'm also a member of the board for Future South and I'm really pleased today um to um have one of my colleagues um, Laurie Wright, uh, join us to talk about um, the future of uh, low carbon shipping. Um, yeah, just a quick note, as Richard has mentioned, if you can keep your mics on mute for now. Questions in the chat box, please. Um, and then, and cameras off as well as we're recording. Um, Laurie is going to do about sort of 20, 25 minutes, and then there'll be plenty of time for, for questions and discussion afterwards. Um, Laurie is um, an associate professor at Sonnet University. He is the director of the Center of Marine Sustainability, our brand new um, center here at Solon, and he's our lead for um, environment and engineering research at, at Solent as well. Um, his expertise concerns the sustainability of um, industry environmental actions and looking to understand the flows of materials and energy and their, and their resulting impacts, with particular interest in reducing environmental impacts in the maritime industry um, and in the marine environment. He's got a very strong track record of appointments to service on external bodies, on the scientific and organizational committees of several international conferences, and as a scientific advisor to a number of national and international working groups. And I know this is gonna be a really, really interesting presentation and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. So without further ado, Laurie, if you'd like to take control of the screen and um, yeah, go ahead. Liz, thank you. Uh, if you just go over here. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm down to one screen, which is uh, making life slightly more difficult for me. So, but there we go. You should now be able to see a picture of a large container ship on the screen there. Okay. Um, I think I want to start with a little bit of a bit of a segue, I suppose, in, in a way. But is to to just ask you wherever you are at the moment in your your office, uh, maybe you're at home. Uh, maybe you sat at the kitchen table, who, who knows? But it's just, just take a look around at the, the stuff that is in front of you. Now, the chances are majority of that stuff, or at least part of it, has at some point in its life been on a ship. It's probably travelled around the world in something that looks a bit like that on the screen there. And shipping and the maritime industry, it's an industry that largely goes unnoticed um, we, we we those of us who are in the profession in the space i think we think about it quite quite regularly but the majority of people don't really think too much about ships the the many thousands of people who are at sea for months at a time and the sheer mass of stuff that is moving around the world it becomes noticeable when things go wrong uh, so for example we, we all remember the ever given being stuck in the suez canal uh, the panic, the second great toilet paper panic that uh, started to ensue from there. Uh, the impacts of COVID-19, obviously, and some of the complications that have arised around regulations from places like Brexit. So it, it is one of those hidden industries. And we, as I said, really don't think about it. But there are in the world, in the, the global commercial fleet, pushing on for 100,000 ships, commercial ships greater than 100 gross tons. And between them, on average, they're moving more than 2 billion deadweight tons of cargo around the world every single year. So to put that in a little bit of context, I thought, I thought I'd try my hand a little bit of art. So this, these containers represent uh, 20 foot TUs, so standard container units. Each one of those represents a thousand standard TU units. And what you're seeing on the screen there is the average number of containers that are coming through Southampton, somewhere between about 33,000 to about 50,000 TU equivalents of cargo per week moving just through the Southampton ports. Scale that to a year, and we're looking at somewhere around 1,760 million TU equivalents of cargo moving through that space. And that's just a single port. So it just puts into context the sheer scale of this operation that, as I said, we don't really think about. Now, 
the other thing behind this is it's generally cheap. I, I was having a look around this morning to try and get a, an idea of price. And, and even with the increase in shipping costs that have happened as a result of COVID and a number of containers being in the wrong place, uh, empty containers not making their way back to port, it is still possible and cheaper for me to move one kilo. So if we imagine we had a an object that was about a litre in volumetric size, weighing about a kilo, if I wanted to move that from the UK to Australia, by far the cheapest option is to send it on containerized ship. Uh, it would be cheaper for me to move that object by ship than it is to buy a first class stamp. Now, that puts it in context, it is a much, much cheaper option. And that, that's a function of the scale of this kind of operation. When we're dealing with the ships uh, the size of something like the Triple E class, there's a huge economy of scale. Much, much cheaper than moving something, say, by air. But of course, you have to accept that it's going to take a little bit of time. Now, it's also one of the most efficient modes of transport in terms of emissions. So if I want to move my, my kilogram uh, from, uh, from the UK down into Australia, the way I would do it, just looking at the statistics, is to move it by the sea. We look at the different options there. These are typical values. These are averaged out across uh, the, the various modes of transport, air, road, rail, and sea. And it's quite clear that on a ton mile basis or a ton kilometer basis, so that is the movement of a single ton of cargo across one kilometer, that the emission of CO2 associated with that movement is far, far lower moving it by sea. Again, an economy of scale issue. Want to move it by road, significantly higher, or heaven forbid, we want to start moving things by air, uh, and this is something we're seeing an increase in air traffic, uh, things such as uh, as just-in-time deliveries from some of the major online retailers. They have their own air feet to move things around rapidly. But the, the carbon emissions associated with that movement of that same weight far, far exceeds that of moving something by sea. Now, there's a, there's a kind of a but here. Moving things by sea is by far the, the most efficient, it's cost effective, but the global shipping fleet and the maritime industry is responsible for about 3% of all anthropogenic greenhouse gases. To give that a little bit of context, if we were to view that industry as a country and put it into the country league tables, it would rank higher than Germany and Brazil. So it would rank at about sixth largest country in terms of emissions across the world. So it's not an insignificant amount of greenhouse gases we're dealing with. The IMO, so that's the International Maritime Organization, the, the governing body, uh, oh. 170, 174 members uh, across, uh, across the industry, predicts that under a business as usual, scenario, so that is continuing uh, as we are, and taking account for growth in the shipping industry, that we are looking at an increase in emissions somewhere between 50 up to 250% increase. Ships also single largest emission source in the transport sector for, for nitrogen oxides, for sulfur oxides, uh, for particulate matter, uh, all of these things being linked to, uh, to various health conditions and environmental damage. So th there is a clear need to, to address this problem. And it's not to say that there aren't things that are, are seeking to address this. So we look at, say, the IMO. Uh, we have things like MARPOL NX6, which uh, set limits on, uh, on sulfur particularly, but also on NOx. Um, the agreements uh, recently for a 50% net reduction in emissions by 2050. Uh, that went through in 2018, again with the IMO. And the, the energy and environmental design indexes for designing ever better ships. But we've got to go back to that 3%. We're talking very, very large amounts of emission. There are options. There are numerous options out there to try and tackle this problem. The one bit I want to dive into a little bit here is about the, uh, the fuel side of things. 
it's changing the stuff we put in the engine. Now, primarily the, the emissions we're dealing with, they're coming from the engine. That's, that's the problem here. Ships tend to burn uh, residual fuel oils when they're in, in deep sea. And this is the, the stuff that is left over once we've taken the, the higher value of fuels out. Um, it's a very thick, viscous liquid, has to be heated before you passed into the engine. Um, and tends, tends to be a fairly dirty fuel. That's really the reality of the situation. So one option is to look at the propulsive systems and look at how we might change it. There are, uh, before I dive into this, other, other things we might look at. So some of the, the options, things such as, uh, as hydrodynamics of a vessel, improving its efficiency as it moves through the water. So it requires less energy. Uh, economies of scale as ships have got bigger. So the, uh, the carbon emissions per unit moved obviously get lower. Uh, hull cleaning, so roughness on the hull from, from things attaching, attaching themselves to it and, and fouling it, that, uh, that causes increased drag, so looking at technologies for that. But there are, there are numerous ways we can look at this. But let's have a, have a look at the fuels. This is, it's a, it's a limited example, I think, here. This is from some research we, we did recently, looking at the, the grams per megajoule. So if you think about the ship requiring its energy, we're going to measure that in megajoules. And the grams of CO2 per megajoule associated with that, uh, that particular fuel. Uh, so there's a range on there. The two at the bottom you see there are, are the typical fuels we would use, so marine gas oil and heavy fuel oil. Uh, marine gas oil being used when a ship is coming into, uh, into coastal waters and near coastal zones, heavy fuel oil then being used by large ships in the deep sea. So looking at somewhere around the sort of mid 70s to the high 70s grams per megajoule generated. So that's our baseline. There are movements in the industry to move towards using LNG, so liquid natural, uh, natural gas. And that's, that's a technology that, that is proven. It, it exists, uh, has been used for probably 50 years by LNG carriers, and they harness what we would term as the boil off. So as the, the liquid gas boils, uh, they harness that to power their engines. Now used in the right way, it is a fuel that can to some extent, reduce emissions. Now, it's important to caveat that, of course, it is still a fossil fuel, and the ultimate goal in, uh, in climate change uh, uh, sense is to move away from that, but it can reduce emissions. Now, what you'll notice there is the bar is much larger than the HFO and the MGO bars, but that represents the uncertainty that's associated with burning that fuel. That exists because of something we call methane slip. So the, uh, the primary component of LNG is methane, Methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So if you get any uncombusted methane making its way into atmosphere, the problem can actually be made worse using LNG. But it is somewhere we're seeing investment. Moving up from the bottom there, you see things like LNG from biomass, obviously much lower because we, we have a, a, a biogenic carbon input, which is, is offset through the, the growth of the biomass. Uh, methanol, something that has been pushed Quite, uh, quite heavily as a, as a potential option for ship power. Um, again, though, if we produce methanol from fossil fuels, all we're doing is creating an alternative energy carrier, if you will, for, uh, for a fossil fuel. So it actually stands to, again, make the problem worse. Uh, for biomass, again, it reduces it down. But then if we, we move up and look at some of the others, so hydrogen and ammonia are two fuel technologies that are being pushed quite heavily in this space. Now, there's Interesting nuances with these, these particular fuels. Hydrogen uh, is produced in, in, a, in a number of different ways, um, but the most common, by far the most common way, is through a process called steam methane reforming. So that is we take uh, something like natural gas or gasified coal, uh, and it's, uh, it's reformed uh, from the methane and you extract the hydrogen from that, that process. It's quite an energy intensive process, and of course it uses a fossil feedstock. Majority of hydrogen in the world today is produced using that method. Majority of that then goes into industry for various industrial process. So it's seen almost as a byproduct of the, uh, the fossil industry. Now, if technology were to allow and we moved directly to hydrogen, right now we cannot produce enough clean hydrogen to meet demand and we'd again probably make the problem worse by just creating another fossil energy carrier. However, if we can farm and overcome the need for, for clean hydrogen or hydrogen with uh, carbon capture storage or some other way of reducing those emissions, 
then it becomes a more viable option. And you'll see the hydrogen AER, which is a renewable, uh, generally wind-based hydrogen production, much, much lower carbon associated with that. But there are a number of challenges there that need to be overcome, and not, not only in terms of production, but also in terms of getting this stuff on the ship. Um, hydrogen, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to keep in a container. It likes to escape, for one. Uh, but it also doesn't have the same energy density as, uh, as things such as MGO or, or HF. You need a lot more of it volumetrically to, uh, to provide the same energy. Uh, ways of overcoming that is to use something like ammonia. So you can store your hydrogen in ammonia and then use uh, ammonia uh, as the carrier to then extract your hydrogen to propel your, uh, your vessel. Again, though, ammonia from natural gas, it's not really saving us anything. It's just creating a new carrier. But if we can produce ammonia in a renewable way, then we, we start looking at uh, some quite valuable savings. There are, of course, uh, issues with ammonia. Uh, not, not only that it, uh, it has a high toxicity value, so we'd need new protocols around regulation and safety. Um, then the, the top three, these, these are worth mentioning there, but uh, biodiesel, uh, been around for, for quite some time. A viable alternative um, as a drop-in fuel, so we can just simply use it in pre-existing engines, no modification required, you just pop it in the engine and away it goes. Um, but there are issues associated with uh, with conflict for land. Um, so as we move through the, the biofuel uh, technology argument, if we can move towards what we call Gen 4, which is, is algal production, then these technologies become viable. And then the, the top one, and this is, uh, I think, always contentious, actually. The, the idea of nuclear energy in ships and generally I, I think this gets excluded from a lot of debates because of the the perceived contention around it it's potentially quite expensive it needs additional regulation there are of course safety concerns but nuclear fuel uh, has a place in this argument especially for uh, for large deep sea vessel um, so 1950s uh, MV Savannah was built um, as a demonstration, a civilian nuclear vessel. That technology is fairly mature and has been used for a number of years, uh, especially in military applications or in things such as, uh, as icebreakers. The carbon footprint is obviously much, much, much lower. It's a zero carbon fuel effectively. However, there are, of course, concerns around things such as nuclear waste uh, and the associated uh, uh, potential for an accident to happen there. But again, you know, I think it's worth pointing out here that if we, we average the number of uh, major injuries or deaths that's associated with all of these different fuel types, the number associated with things such as coal and oil runs in the order of millions over the times that's been used per, per the, the, the energy generated compared to nuclear, which is really only a percentage point of that particular death rate. So it's, it's a really interesting debate point and something I don't think gets enough attention. Uh, but is, has, a, has, again, a number of uh, issues to overcome. Now, some of these technologies are being implemented, and this, this is just one example I want to share uh, with you. It's part of something we, we term the ISHI project, which is the Implementation of Ship Hybridization Project, funded by uh, Interreg 2Cs. But this is uh, Natalia. So Natalia is a, uh, a pleasure tour barge that operates around Flanders and northern France. And as part of the project, she is uh, having a, a bit of an engine change. Um, she is actually built as a, as a hybrid, so pretty much like a, a Toyota Prius. Uh, but in the, uh, in the bilge, there is a, a whole rack of batteries, and she's capable of running on battery electric power for up to 12 hours. She has a backup diesel generator that then would take over should it be necessary, but the, the vessel itself can operate uh, entirely on electrical power. Um, also in the project, we've got uh, some work looking at things such as crew transfer vessels. Those are those high-speed catamarans that take people out to wind farms uh, and looking at ways that can be propelled with hydrogen power. Uh, we've also got another, uh, what, what the Dutch term is a party barge, uh, very similar to this one, but two-story. They're looking again to use pure hydrogen propulsion. These examples work uh, and we can prove they work, but they work because they generally are either low speed so they have low power requirements, or they're operating in a mode where they're returning to their, their home ports on a daily basis. It allows them to be refueled and restocked. The difficulty now comes is scaling this technology to start hitting those bigger ships that we spoke about at the beginning. And there are a number of barriers really that exist in the space that need to be overcome. 
Firstly is, is this idea of what, what we would term as the split incentive, I think here. It, it's kind of the, the classical landlord versus the renter problem. Uh, you know, ships, vessels, they're often chartered. Uh, the owner doesn't operate them. The owner simply then effectively rents them out to, uh, to somebody else to use them. That really presents the, the owner, the vessel builder, with very little incentive to, to make investments, particularly in retrofit or in new and possibly, uh, I hesitate to say unproven, but, but non-market consistent technology because they are not necessarily going to see a return on that investment, especially where the market, uh, the chartering market, doesn't value those interventions. So there's a, a barrier that has to be overcome there to, to enable and encourage ship owners, builders to use and implement these technologies. And you're, you're seeing some of this happening. So for example, Maersk uh, investing in LNG infrastructure in the Far East, they're building their own fueling infrastructure to allow their ships to be fueled uh, in that space. So it's, it's, it's overcoming that, that requirement, that, that incentive split. There's also, of course, a, a financial barrier. Um, ships are exceedingly expensive things. Um, they, they, they're not cheap. And there is restricted access, I suppose, to, to the market capital to build these kind of vessels. And Within this context, I think it's, it's, it's important to point out that if we were to try and achieve the 50% the reduction by 2050, we're looking at requiring significant, in the order of nearly trillions of US dollars of investment. So that just to get to that 50%, between 2030 and 2050, we are looking at just over a trillion US dollars of investment required in fueling technology to get us there. That's, that's not insignificant. And it's also quite a high risk investment. Now, if you were to imagine a similar investment scenario on a, on a terrestrial basis, generally these things come with kind of secondary benefits, secondary industries that can connect in and, and share the benefit and share the investment risk. And that, that really doesn't exist with ships. They're, they're effectively independent. So that investment is, is sold and made into the ship. So it's a very, very high risk investment. The other thing, of course, is time. Really, to, to hit that 2050 target, we need to be looking at making a minimum of a 35% fuel shift uh, to low carbon propulsion technologies to hit that target. Now, if we were to, uh, to up that and say we're going to hit the Paris target, so that's the 1.5 degree temperature rise, that requires a 70% minimum fuel shift to low carbon fueling technologies in our ships. That that's again, that's a big shift. And you've got to remember in terms of time, these vessels are built with 30 year lifespan. So the vessels we're building today will still be in operation in 2050. So time is, is very much against us. The other uncertainty, if you will, is around regulation. The IMO has 174 members and enacting and agreeing regulation takes time it takes a long time to, to agree and there is a, an argument already that the 50 percent target by 2050 is far too conservative and there are no interim targets in place on there so there is really no way of, of monitoring or moving through that space but it it takes a lot of time just to certify to understand the new fueling regulations is going to take time and again time is against us there is also the uncertainty of supply here. Oil and gas is available. We know it's available. We, we know ships can access the market. And there is some certainty in terms of the pricing mechanisms that are associated with that. That doesn't exist in a lot of the alternative fuel markets. Uh, hydrogen, as an example, on a per kilo basis, to up to 10 times the price of using traditional diesel. It's highly more, uh, more volatile financially. And there's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario with uh, various players in the market waiting for someone else to make that first move to then build the infrastructure that's going to allow them to fuel their ships and their vessels. What I want to come to a close on, though, is this, this point. We transitioned from sail to coal. 
and then we transitioned from coal to oil, which gave us much more uh, much more deck space, much more cargo space. That transition, depending where you, uh, you you market start and end point, from coal to oil, somewhere between 60 and 120 years of time to make that transition. And to really put it into to context, this is, uh, is motor vessel Badger. She still operates on the Great Lakes. She's one of the last large coal fired ships in the world. So we're still using coal, haven't actually completed that transition. And actually, when we look at the, the numbers, the science, what we're asking is to make that transition in the next 10 years from oil to renewables. And it, it really is a, a phenomenal challenge that has to be overcome to, uh, to make, make, that, uh, make that happen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much. I'm uh, happy to, to continue this debate in the, in the questions, but do please get in touch with me as well, uh, on, particularly on email. It's uh, probably the easiest way of getting hold of me uh, if you want to keep in touch. Laurie, thank you very much. That's, uh, I think, given us some food for thought. Uh, I've spotted a couple of questions um, that were popping up as you were talking, so I'll, I'll start. I'll start at the start. Start at the start. Um, um, David, <laughs> David asks, what about fusion energy? And I think uh, probably a few of us will pick up on the nuclear um, issue. Um, do you have any thoughts on on fusion energy? Um, familiar with. Yeah, I mean, yes, I, mean, it, I, it's one of those things. So I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wander slightly here, but you know, I'm, I'm a big Star Trek fan. I'm, I'm a bit of a Trekkie, and yeah, we talk about things like fusion, these kind of these technologies that are, they're still a bit of a pipe dream at the moment. But if 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 it can be cracked, the potential of a technology like that is phenomenal, and I think there are movements that are happening in that space. So. Um, uh, Skunk Works, which is the, the lab associated with Lockheed Martin in the US, uh, demonstrated a small scale fusion reactor, lasted a few seconds. Uh, doesn't sound like a lot, but it's more than a lot of other people have managed to achieve. Um, if, if it can be cracked, I think it actually overcomes a lot of the, the nuclear problems that you know, I was alluding to. But it's, it's a big if, and that, that might, be, might be five years, could be 10 years, could be 20 years. I, I don't think we know enough to put put our money onto that that you know, that square at this stage. One to watch. Mm. <laughs> um, there's another question here about, um, yeah, uh, solar panels and, yeah, the possibility of, yeah, solar panels sort of supplementing, yeah, fossil fuels yeah. as a possibility or other fuels. Yeah, I, you are seeing demonstrations of that. There's, um, I can't remember the company exactly. I believe it's a Japanese ship owner provider has come up with a concept for a, a bulk carrier, which is covered with solar panels. Um, the, you've got a couple of problems here. I mean, the amount of solar you can put on ship, your real estate is quite limited. Um, you can't use them on things like uh, a container ship because you can't kind of take them off and put them back. And because of that limited real estate, the kind of power you can generate is enough to perhaps power your auxiliaries. So that's things like your light, heat, your crew, uh, but when we're we're talking about the engine, you know, to, to kind of uh, you know, give a bit of context to this, these things are burned thousands of liters every single hour of fuel. This is this is a massive, massive energy door. So it, it can supplement, but it's not going to replace that that space at that point. And then you've got the added issue of dealing with a saline environment, um, which you know, complex electronics don't tend to like salt water. So, uh, so it's it's certainly a supplementary technology, but it's not necessarily a uh, a solution. It's not the panacea, no. Um, Bob asks, um, what happened to solid wing sails, um, e.g., Walker wing sails once used on the MV Ashington mm. to supplement propulsion? Um, still and what are people still... <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so, I mean, I, it, you go back. Of course, we use we use canvas sails. Now you, you see solid panels basically that are, are, are controlled so they can harness right. the wind um, that that technology is still being used in some cases there are companies that are looking investing in this um, it, it's again it's kind of a supplementary technology it's never going to re replace your your primary propulsion and I think it, it's worth remembering sails we used sail for hundreds of years you know it does work but the difference being that say if we wanted to go uh, the uh, what we term as the wrong way around the northern hemisphere. You were doing this the whole way, tacking backwards and forwards, and the journey would take 
a long time, take months. Whereas we've got used to ships being able to make the same journey in a matter of weeks. And there's, there's that transition. So going in the correct direction, solid sails as an option. Um, another sort of link to that would be something like Magnus rotors. So these are those big spinning columns you sometimes see on ships using uh, what we call the Magnus effect, but it's, it's a similar principle. It's kind of pulling you using the wind. But again, it's not, it's not replacing the need for that primary energy source on the ship. So it's, it's a good supplementary, but it's, it's never going to replace it entirely. I think there was another yeah another question on sales as well yeah so so handling technology yeah, yeah. yeah. so really yeah. supporting yeah. technology like you say yeah. i mean there is a, a push amongst some companies there are there's a couple of companies who have built sail vessels and they're moving cargo using sail um, but it's it's a very niche market i think that that's the reality of it yeah um David has said, um, yeah, puts, uh, yeah, put my money on electrolyzed uh, hy hydrogen being the dominant fuel within five years and within 20 years after that. But the problem at the moment, chicken and egg scenario, the ships don't use it because it isn't available at the ports. The ports don't make it available because the ships don't use it. Yes, very good point. Do you, do you see yeah. that changing, though? You could see potentially that. Yeah, I, so the, the project I mentioned, the Ishii, Ishii project, one of uh, or, or two of our major partners are, are ports. And the reason they're involved is because they're looking at how do we provide infrastructure for fueling. Um, and as a port, they don't want to invest unless there's a demand uh, for, for that fuel. Um, it's quite quite an expensive uh, investment for them you know, to, to provide alternative fueling solutions. So one of the, the vessels um, is actually operating out of that port. So it's trying to connect the two together. Um, of course, one vessel using an entire fueling infrastructure is not, it's not going to kind of create a new market so it, it's trying to overcome you know that that space if the fueling network's there then we might see more people using it and then then it might start to pick up a little bit um there are things other things technologically to be overcome like i said you know going deep sea with with hydrogen is, is currently just it's it's pretty much impossible we're not we're not going to see that happening um anytime too soon but short sea um, you know, port to port stuff across Northern Europe, then that that's where it might, it might start to become much more viable. You might start to see these technologies coming into play. But yeah, if I was, if I was putting money down, I'd, I'd probably agree with you. Um, I saw, yeah, um, yeah, this question here, I saw a hand up as well. We can, uh, it's, it's, it disappeared. There was a hand up, but it's gone down again. But I think it was from the same person. Um, yeah, is, is wave generated energy a good supplement and i'm guessing by that the idea that as the ship is going along it's being able to take yeah is that something <laughs> it's able to absorb some of the energy from the waves and the way in which it's engineered um, so i have to ask some of my yacht colleagues on that my design naval architect colleagues i i would assume you could do it but i would assume you'd also have a one of those kind of scenarios where you're what you're taking in is then offset by creating the thing to push through that wave in, in the first place. So it, it kind of, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I probably don't know enough about the technology to give you a definitive answer, but there, there are some examples. There was a ship, um, it's called Energy Observer. She's a, a sail hydrogen yacht. Um, had a, a chance to go on her when she was in London a couple of years ago, but she generates hydrogen using solar while she's at sea. So when she's under sail, she takes up seawater, splits it down, hydrolyzes and, and creates hydrogen. So that's a kind of similar idea. Um, not practical when you're trying to build a massive container ship because the amount of space you will give over to to that facility, it, it makes it you know non-cost effective, I think, at that point. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I see. Thank you. Yeah, just to clarify, yeah, like a wave generating unit attached. That's what that's what the yeah. question was getting at. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting okay. question. I don't but, uh, one to yeah okay one to take away to the to think about. <laughs> yeah um i saw a question from did i see one from yeah richard there yeah so container ships keep getting bigger and bigger so i think we saw mm. in the suez canal and uh, will that trend continue or might we see yeah smaller boats delivering to smaller ports against the economy of scale i guess is yeah yeah i think certainly with deep sea uh we're already seeing bigger ships so the one that got stuck in the, the canal is is a um kind of a suez max if you want you know we have the panamax the, the, the suez 
I mean, I'm coining a bit of a phrase there, but it, it's it's one of the biggest ships that's going to fit through the sewers. There are ships that can't move through that space already. So you're seeing you know, enormous ships. These things are so big. And until you see them up close, it's you, you just you can't get your head around it. They are just phenomenal. Um, the, the engineering wise, nothing stopping us to building bigger ships. They could be built. It's really down to who's got the investment to build these things, whether the appetite is there to build them. Um, but saying that, the other trend we're starting to see is things like automation, um, remote ship operation, those kind of things. And that that may shift us towards smaller, especially feeder type ships. So moving between, say, Rotterdam and, and Southampton, you might see a different trend there. So you might see a sort of a smaller coastal ship that's moving backwards and forwards and moving those efficiencies. So you've got these massive deep sea and then you've got these much smaller feeder vessels moving about. Uh, perhaps using renewable energy, perhaps operating remotely. You know, so there's lots of you know, lot, lots of little possibilities, and it, it, it's, it's hard to to pin down. But I, I think you will see bigger ships yet. I think we will see bigger things that we've got out there. Right. Are you allowed to just sort of mention that that is something that Solent is looking at, the kind of remote technology? Of yeah, I mean, I can. Yeah. So we 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 just to, to plug ourselves a bit here, but uh, we are uh, working on a, a project at the moment looking at remote technology operations. So using our, our lake facility and our simulation facility and looking at how that technology might work. So, um, you know, you, when you bring a crew ashore, how do they actually control a ship remotely? And there's, again, there's, there's a huge number of challenges that have to be overcome uh, to make that mainstream. Uh, but there are examples around the world of where, where this has been implemented. Um, there's the e-ferry in Norway is a kind of good example of it. But I think it, it's certainly a trend to watch. You will see remote operation. And the, the joy, or I think the joy is probably the wrong word for it, but the, the, the side effect, perhaps, of that is that you remove a lot of the requirement for auxiliary energy generation because you don't have people on board. So that reduces your energy requirement that then starts making some of these technologies more viable. So it's, it's a... Again, an interesting space with, with implications, not just for, for remote operation, but for, for crews and, and for decarbonisation. Yeah, in, yeah, interesting. Again, another, another one to watch. Um, yeah, question here from David about um, being able to use the energy contained in, in the different temperature mm -hmm. between shallow and deep water. Yeah, is there yeah. a way of... Making... In theory, I suppose there would be. I mean, it's... it's one would guess it's similar to sort of heat pump type technology. That, that's probably what we'd be looking at. So the idea that you're taking a uh, temperature differential between um, you kind of you know, heat pump the refrigerant gas and the, the ambient atmosphere, you can dense that down, you create heat. Um, I think it would be a question of how you do it without affecting the hydrodynamics of the vessel, because you, you'd need something that allows you to harness that which means going down yeah. um, every time you put something hanging off the hull you can increase drag which then effectively increases energy requirement as well so i yeah i mean perhaps something we ought to be looking at actually but it's it's a question of how how do you do it i think would be the, the big question there i don't yeah. know if i'm asked no david david you might want to patent that idea could uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> revolutionize things yeah thank you yeah um okay so here's here's one i guess it's something we're thinking about as well um offsetting carbon emissions yeah um are there any yeah in your as far as you know any carbon capture technologies that could be put into the system to capture carbon? uh yeah let's just kind of split the two apart i mean start with offset um yeah. I yeah I know there's obviously, it's obviously a huge debate on this personally I I think it's it's really not it's not an option we should be talking about it's an excuse that we can use to make us feel better um, I flew around the world and I planted a tree yeah it doesn't it doesn't doesn't work like that <laughs> doesn't work that way um, I mean so the issue that I suppose that pops out of this is we talk about things like net zero and offsetting is a big part of that it, it, I don't believe that is the way to do it. I think it allows us to continue doing what we're doing, gives us an excuse to do it. Um, carbon capture is a, a different, it's a technological response. Uh, so, you know, it's actually taking the emissions of carbon and then, in essence, sticking them underground, putting them back into deep storage. Um, not operating at a massive scale yet, but it could be a way of uh, introducing what I'd, I'd see as a transition technology. So if we're moving towards hydrogen, 
Um, if we just use SMR, hydrogen emissions are massive. They're actually bigger than petroleum. If you can capture that and introduce carbon capture, then that does bring it down, which allows the market to transition to true renewable uh, hydrogen production. So it, it, it has a place, I think, but again, it, it's a question of massive scale. You know, this has to be done on, on an enormous scale. And would that be at the point at which the hydrogen is being generated, you would capture the, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. But it's it, 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 it sort of, you know, for something as a local example, you think of the scale of Forley, capturing the hydrogen from that, uh, the, the, the CO2 from that, where, how do you ship it? How do you move it? Where do you put it? So there's, mm -hmm. a you know, again, a lot of barriers that need to be overcome before that becomes a, a, a truly viable option. But it is, I think, a strong potential as a transition technology. Okay. Um, question from Simon, might we see a different way of operating, utilising automation and nature? Um, and I'll, I'll follow on with, with Bob's question as well. Yeah. yeah. Should we be slowing shipping down yeah. even more? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll start with the second one because I think it feeds the, the one above. But um, uh, slow steaming, is the, the idea of just slowing down a bit, you know, reducing from, say, 24 knots to 18 knots, for example, you, you might add a week on your journey time. But the the way uh, in which energy demand works is we're pushing ourselves through a through water. If you imagine you're going to a swimming pool, the faster you try and swim, the more energy it's requiring. It's a, a log of uh, uh, exponential relationship. So the the saving is significant, and it's something you have seen. So uh, jump back to Maersk as an example. They did actually implement slow steaming to save fuel. Their ships are capable of going about ten knots faster than they do. It, but it's it's way cheaper for them to, to slow down so it saves saves a lot and it's a very simple solution um jumping up to the automation thing the idea of you sort of if i interpret the question correctly automation is coming in and you're seeing things like ai systems that are beginning to use nature to their benefits so um navigation for example if you have an ai system it can calculate uh historical weather patterns trends movements tidal movements wave movements all these things and when you run that uh, through a navigation system, you kind of push a button and it spits out a course. The course looks bizarre, but of course the AI has taken into account a lot of the probabilistic outcomes to reduce the energy requirement for moving that ship. So it, it's accounting for things such as using a tide to increase efficiency, uh, making sure you're not going against a wave movement, for example. So, so those kind of technologies are, are happening. They're, they're beginning to become mainstream. But there's, again, a kind of behavioral shift whilst vessels are crewed to make sure that the, the, the crew implements that slightly odd looking course. But as we move to automation, of course, then the AI makes that decision for us. You know, it, it starts to take over that, that space. And it, it does make these slightly what might seem odd decisions, but actually it's saving time and money and carbon. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, just, yeah, taking Richard's question, yeah, it doesn't seem that money will be the driver, so will it be regulations? And if so, uh, is that starting to happen? Will shipping get discussed at COP? <laughs> I certainly hope so. I, I think yeah. it will. There are, there are some subgroups obviously looking at shipping. Um, I think it's one of those things, it's been the elephant in the room for quite some time. We, we didn't take account of aviation and shipping when it went international because nobody wanted responsibility for it. Uh, that's, that's changing. Um, I think countries are, are starting to, to wake up to this as a, as a serious issue. Um, money could be the driver if the regulatory reforms were in place to build the market to allow it. The way the system is built is not conducive to, to financial profit, so for the, as we said, the shipbuilders. Um, but that, that requires shift. And th there are rumblings of this. You know, there, there are talk about it in things such as the IMO. It's just it's a... You try and get agreement over what you're going to have for lunch with five people. It takes you a while. Try and get 174 different flag states to, to agree on how we're going to reduce carbon emissions. So it it is kind of moving in the right direction. Again, it's just time. It really is just time. It's, it's just time. Yeah. A time we, we don't have much of either. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Question here. Have you got the time or inclination, inclination to look at the big picture? E.g. HST plus maglev across the Silk Road, making, Ooh. oh, I see, right, yeah. It's yeah. So making ships redundant. Yeah. Um, I would love to, actually. I think looking at these, we did some work looking at rail versus aviation, so we had a little play with some numbers on that. Um, 
it, it's one of those it, it's a, an interesting one it all depends on how you look at the problem over time um you build something like a maglev system it requires an awful lot of concrete so that's a massive massive carbon investment um, which makes it look better if you've kind of already got the ship keep using it for a little while um alternatively if you can sort of do that in a low carbon manner or guarantee low carbon energy it's a high speed low carbon uh option um again though i think it's it's one of those things it, it's time money um and it's also political agreement to to run that that kind of line and i know there is some movements uh in in the far east china in particular trying to increase its rail capacity across mm. into the european markets and it'd be interesting to see how that develops but yeah, yeah. i it's certainly something i'd love to look at it's just a, uh, just a question of uh, finding the time <laughs> finding the time yeah yeah um yeah question from yeah so just this one question from charles i think one to pick off up, up la, pick up offline um, so at Solent Winds, we're working on um, modernized take on sailing ships with a number of modern technologies incorporated into design. Is it something that Solent would be interested in, in looking at? If so, how best to connect with the university? Is it to send you an email, Laurie? It is, best? yes. Yeah, we'd yeah. love to have a chat. Um, what I can do is we can have an initial chat and I can uh, connect you in. It's certainly certainly something we are, are looking at, um, especially in our, our uh, yacht design naval architecture side of things so, so yeah love love to have a conversation on that so do do send me an email um which i can throw into the chat thanks brilliant um and i was just thinking yeah question for me perhaps yeah is the broader picture how much do you have a feel within the container ship how much stuff is is crap how much we hear about it at christmas so you know we've got container ships they come in come into Southampton and the rumour is they're just full of Christmas crapola um, that gets used once and then binned and no one cares about. Is there a, a, a kind of a thinking around that we've got to cut down on how much crap goes in, how much crap goes into these containers anyway? Not crap, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> items. Single use material. Single use material. Yeah. And maybe this plays into the circular economy argument as well. We're buying yeah. and throwing away, and we need to change that model, and that might reduce the amount of stuff moving about on the ocean. Um, in in a short answer, yes. Yeah. Answer, yes. <laughs> uh, longer answer, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, if we just took, let's, let's take a bottles of drinks or something like single-use plastic, kind of classic example of single-use plastic bottles um, moving around the world. Uh, four or about four and a half billion plastic bottles produced last year. You know, it's just just eye-watering numbers. And we move them around the world, and you've got this material that is designed to to last 500 years, quite quite easily actually. Uh, and we we use it once, which is when if, when you put it quite bluntly, it's it's bizarre actually. We we build this this material or this product that is going to last and last and last and last and last, and we design it to be used once. And then we move it around the world, um, and it—it's kind of a byproduct, I suppose, of our modern economy and the way we, we work. But it's—we've got used to that, and I, I think you're dead right that actually there was a, a sort of an underlying piece here that 50 years ago that didn't happen. We didn't do that. We didn't need it. We don't argue. We don't need it today, but we we still do it. So yeah, it, it's but it's a it's a massive socio-economic shift. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's uh, that's a massive change, but it, it's probably necessary in, in many respects. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, right. Just seeing here. Oh yeah. Question. Mm. Yeah. Question from David at the State of Development on large commercial airships. Yeah, that's certainly happening. Certainly yeah. happening. Um, obviously, a technology that's been around for about a century. The concept of airships um, was viewed as a as a, uh, a sort of a technology was going to take off. You take something like the Empire State Building, the thing on the top, the spike is actually an airship dock. So that, you know, it was something that was clearly thought was going to, was going to go ahead. And then, of course, we had uh, things like the Hindenburg, um, which is actually as, as a kind of a, a segue into hydrogen is one of those reasons that some people go, oh, what about the Hindenburg? Um, Hindenburg disaster, it wasn't the hydrogen that burned, the, the initial big flash you see, if you ever see any, the, the pictures or video, that's the hydrogen, it burned off in seconds, it just went. The bit that burned was the highly flammable paint that was painted on the steel superstructure. And then the diesel 
that was contained in the subdecks of the the, the, uh, the ship. So it's it's easy to wag the finger at hydrogen. It wasn't hydrogen that was the problem. Um, in terms of development, there's a couple of companies I'm aware of that are working in this space, and again, massive potential if if it can be commercialized and if it can kind of challenge the status quo. You know, it, it's potential for being able to move across terrestrial areas as well, where you can't move a ship. So being able to go across, say, North America, where your trip on a ship is either to go all the way round, or to to load it on a train or onto road. Massive potential for something like airships to operate in that space. Uh, but yeah, again, it's time. I, you know, I I think it's just down to time and development and see see who the players are on the political will. Yeah, like so many things. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and unless there are any more questions, um, I was just going to um, read. Richard's just popped in a quick note to say. Uh, next Future South webinar, just for your um, calendars, is the 11 uh, is 11 a.m. on Wednesday, the 24th of November, and that will be an introduction to the Green Tech South team, um, who will demonstrate how they support innovators. There's the link for booking, um, and and yeah, any other any other bits and pieces in there. It's not too garbled, but I think I garbled it a bit more, Richard. So so yes, do join us for that if you're if you can. Um, Yes, just to say as well, for those that don't know, um, yeah, J um, Jason Light and Ben Earl, two of our Future South directors, who many of you may know, are currently cycling from London to Glasgow um, as part of the COP26 um, kind of, um, ancillary campaigning. Um, so they're not taking donations of money, but they are keen to collect um, pledges from people via the via that link there. So pledges for yeah, reducing carbon footprints. So fantastic, uh, yeah, fantastic initiative. So please um, do, uh, yeah, uh, get, get involved if you can uh, and pledge. Uh, yeah, just to say, um, Laurie, if you'd like to um, just mention a little bit about our event next. Um, so we have our own sort of set of COP activities taking place next week, which includes um, an event on Wednesday um, late uh, afternoon, evening um, here at Solon East Park Terrace. Laurie, if you'd like to give yes, a mention. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, Liz. Just to, uh, to plug it, I've actually got a quick slide I can throw up, which gives you the details. Um, so we are running an event uh, on November 3rd, um, part of the university's Environment Day. Uh, but in the evening, we're hosting a, uh, a panel expert discussion um, on, on some of the things I was talking about today, but uh, be joined by, by Brian Johnson, who's chief exec of the, uh, the MCA, and uh, Mukath Nataradajan, who's uh, a colleague from the USA, from uh, WSP, is a, an energy consultant there. So um, exciting evening. Um, we're hoping people come prepared with questions. It's not scripted. So uh, do come with difficult and awkward questions. Uh, but running uh, five o'clock for, for networking, six o'clock to kick off, uh, closing at about seven o'clock. There's an event right there as well, uh, if anybody does want to come. Just to say, though, of course, uh, because of, of the ongoing uh, elements of COVID, that the, the space we would normally have is a little bit more limited than it would be otherwise. So uh, if you would like to come, please you know, book as, as soon as possible. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah, should be that should be really good. There's been some good questions here in the chat. So yeah, anyone who's around, yeah, come along next Wednesday evening. I'm sure we'd love to have you in the audience um, for discussion. That'd be great. Well, I can't see any more questions at this point. Um, but that's been great. Thank you, everyone, for your yeah for your questions. That, that's a really interesting discussion. And thank you, Laurie, for your yeah for your time and your your insight into what's happening in the sector. Um, so yeah, great to hear. So much going on, but clearly lots of work to do. Um, so thank you very much for that. Yeah. So yeah, link to book there for the event right next yeah next Wednesday evening. Um, so if that's everything, yeah, just to say yeah, thank you very much for yeah for coming this morning, and yeah, see you all at the yeah future future South events. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs> Bye that's for now. Great.